billion. That's the number of people on the planet today. And just as you start to wrap your heads around that number, the United Nations comes out and predicts that by the year 2050, there will in fact be 9 billion people on the planet. So if you think we have challenges now of housing, clothing, feeding, moving, keeping these people healthy, that challenge is about to get much larger. It's going to reach epic proportions. So should we be worried? You know, I for one am not. I am an optimist, but if you just look at the history of mankind, you can tell that we have been here before. I mean, for Christ's sake, we were hunter-gatherers in the savannas of Africa once, and look at us today with our iPads and everything around us. Because every time mankind has been confronted with this challenge of housing, clothing, feeding, moving, educating itself, it has responded to that challenge by designing solutions. And the story has been incredible, but that story really has two things, two components to it that fuse together. Human creativity, the ability to think different, to never take no for an answer, to keep striving. Human creativity, when combined with technology, you know, you have to really remember that stone tools in their time were a huge technological breakthrough. And it's been the combination of these two things that have fueled the evolution of mankind and the answer to all those problems. Now, creativity, human creativity, remains a constant endeavor. We always try to think different. But the thing that has been really rapidly changing in recent times is the arc of technology. Did you, for instance, know that there are more transistors produced in a year than grains of rice harvested? And what's more, those transistors cost less to produce than all that rice. So computing power is increasing exponentially. Its cost is reducing exponentially. And this means that computing power is getting democratized. There's near ubiquitous access to computing power than ever before. The other thing that has turned ubiquitous is connectivity. In the last 15 years, the number of people connected has grown a hundredfold. There's nearly two and a half billion people in the world now connected through the internet to each other, to information, to that ubiquitous computing power. It's true that each and every one of us now has a supercomputer at our disposal. Every time we type something into that search box in Google, and the result comes back in a microsecond, that's a supercomputer, or actually a bank of supercomputers, doing work for you. You not only have access to supercomputing, you have access to super brain. That connected world means you can tap into expertise from around the world. You can share ideas, learn from each other, inspire each other, and even finance each other's ideas. Cloud-enabled, crowd-empowered. And this crowd is now empowered with more things, new machines. All that computing power is going into new types of machines, machines that can see and make sense of the world around them, and machines that can remake the world, machines like 3D printers, CNC machines that are portable now, desktop laser cutters, machines can remake the world. Now, machines have been around for a while. That's not new news. But what's different about these machines is that they are smart, small, and affordable. So for the first time since the Industrial Revolution, you don't have to go to the factory to make stuff. The factory comes to you. So technology be, has been on a rapid clip, and we need to couple that with human creativity. And this combination of human creativity and technology, when applied to solving problems, that process of solving problems within constraints is really what we call design. And I really want to spend a moment here because design is really misunderstood. 
is often thought of as something aesthetic, something stylistic. Only really creative and brilliant and artistic people do design. That's wrong. Design is about solving problems. And therefore, really by definition, the future is a design challenge. All those things we talked about, all those challenges, really require a design methodology to tackle. Now, why am I the one talking about this? See, I'm a software guy. My day job is running product teams that build software. But you know, as I've had the opportunity to interact with people around the world who are trying to solve these problems, I've turned into a little social scientist by night. And so what I've been observing recently is something profound is happening in this, in this equation. And I'd put it to you this way. Small players, empowered by technology, are playing the big game. What I mean by that is individuals and entrepreneurs, small players, are tackling the big challenges. So it's not just big governments or big companies that are trying to take on those challenges. There are people everywhere, like you and me, who are tackling these design challenges. And we like to call that 9 billion people designing for 9 billion. So designed by 9 billion for 9 billion. And I'm going to illustrate this uh, movement, if you will, with some examples. And I'd like to start with that challenge of housing that we you know, briefly mentioned. So here's a couple of entrepreneurs in the UK, a company called Facet Homes, that are completely rethinking the way houses are designed and constructed. So using that ubiquitous computing power we talked about, they create intelligent digital 3D models. And those portable CNC machines, they have one on every job site. And what those CNC machines do is that they take those digital models and they break them down into tiny components. Think of this literally like a bunch of Lego blocks or puzzle pieces being spit out by those CNC machines. They're actually even numbered just like Lego blocks would be. And then those pieces are assembled on site by workers that require no more skill than reading those numbers on those components into gorgeous homes that require nothing more than a hammer to assemble. Now the homes are beautiful, they're strong, they meet every expectation. But what's really striking is the promise of this approach to generate millions of homes around the world addressing one of those pressing challenges. Let's take a look at the world of medicine or health. Here's one really important fact that some of you may be aware of. There's 30 million people around the world in need of prosthetic limbs. The challenge, of course, is most of them cannot afford these limbs. And so there's a company called DREV, there's that letter D for design, again, that took on this challenge and using some of these new manufacturing techniques, new materials, and digital design techniques, iterated their way through a design and came up with a prosthetic knee that costs $13 to make. And since that time, 5,000 people have received that knee and there's been a 95% success rate. They're tapping into the power, again, of all those things we talked about, and now they're tapping into the power of the crowd to finance more recipients of these knees. Now, if you're not inspired or excited by those two examples, let me go to a whole different scale of design and manufacturing. Let's go down, not just to the microscopic level, but to the nano level. These are some researchers at Harvard University that are using the same technique of design and manufacturing, but creating nano robots out of DNA proteins. And what these nano robots are programmed to do is to go hunt for leukemia cells. And when they find those leukemia cells, to open up, deliver a payload that knocks those leukemia cells out and then shut back down. What's really revolutionary about this approach is that by doing such targeted attacks, none of the other cells are disturbed. So for the first time, cancer treatment can be really focused on cancer cells without causing damage to the surrounding tissue and organs. That's a huge step forward in making people healthier, and it's using some of those modern manufacturing and design techniques. 
But let's now go to another completely different domain, and that's the domain of education. Can we use those same techniques of ubiquitous computing, crowd inspiration, to tackle some of the problems facing the world of education? What if you're a fossil hunter, like Dr. Louise Leakey, working in Kenya, in the Turanga Basin, discovering hundreds of specimens a year, fragile fossils that you want to share with your colleagues around the world or inspire future anthropologists by showing what, you know, what is being discovered. But you are running into this challenge. You're in the middle of nowhere, and the stuff that you develop is really fragile. It can very easily break apart. What do you do? Well, you remember we talked about those machines that see? Well, cameras are machines that see. And what Dr. Louise Leakey did was take a bunch of photographs using those cameras of each of these fossils and using a software program that my team developed called Recap Photo, turn it into a 3D model. This is the cloud at work supercomputing this 3D result. And you can see this is a real digital replica of an individual fossil that anyone by going online to africanfossils.org can experience. And it is really very useful from a research perspective where somebody can study the specimen, compare it to other specimens uh, that they might discover, understand the differences, and start to comment on evolution. Or if you're in the classroom and really want to turn that digital object into something physical, you can 3D print it or CNC machine it. So again, they're designing a better answer, one person in the middle of Kenya. And can that approach of cloud and crowd be used not just to design the future, but to understand the past, even when the past has ceased to exist, as in the case, this unfortunate case, of the Obamian Buddhas in Afghanistan. Brian Matthews in San Francisco just went online, looked for photographs taken by tourists who may have gone to that site before it was wrecked, and using that same program, that same sort of cloud-based computing algorithm, turns and returns back a 3D experience of that Bamiyan Buddha for current and future generations living in Afghanistan to understand their cultural heritage. But cultural heritage is not just an issue in Afghanistan. Here in India, there's a rich cultural heritage. It's one of the richest cultural traditions in the world. And we're doing, I'm happy to share with you that my team is working with government bodies here, with NGOs, to really, again, tap into the power of the crowd and the cloud to help preserve the Indian heritage in digital form. So in the time that I have had with you now, I've been able to share a few examples of people around the world who are tackling these challenges from the nano scale to the urban scale. And now, when I say I'm an optimist, when I say I have hope that the challenges that we face in the future will be tackled by individuals empowered by technology, uh, people just like you and me, you now know why. You know, the future really is a design challenge. And then you and I, empowered by technology, can be people who design solutions to those challenges. We can be part of design by 9 billion for 9 billion. And I invite you all to design a better future with us. Thank you.